In November 2007, an ordinary custody battle transformed into an extraordinary saga as Richard Ricky Chekevdia and his mother, Shannon Wilfong, vanished without a trace. The battleground shifted from courtrooms to the realm of the unknown, leaving a community baffled and a family in agony. For years, the case puzzled investigators and ignited speculation until an unexpected breakthrough rewrote the narrative. Amidst the backdrop of legal turmoil and emotional strife, Ricky and Shannon's disappearance became a haunting enigma that refused to fade from memory. He went missing for years, until they looked in the dresser, hiding Ricky in plain sight. For a staggering two years, a quiet two-story rural house in Franklin County, Southern Illinois, harbored a sinister secret that defied belief. In the heart of this seemingly ordinary abode, Richard Ricky Chekevdia, a six-year-old boy, and his mother, Shannon Wilfong, were ensnared in a nightmarish ordeal that played out in a chillingly tiny chamber, a room scarcely larger than a household washing machine. The story begins with a custody battle rife with tension and conflict, a battle that would lead to an unthinkable descent into captivity. Ricky and Shannon vanished into the shadows in November 2007, leaving behind a father embroiled in a bitter legal struggle. But what emerged from the shadows two years later was far more harrowing than anyone could have imagined. Fresh out of the county jail, okay, come on up. Diane Dobbs shows us the home that was a hiding place for her daughter and grandson. And yes, I did. I put them in there. I got really scared and panicky when I seen a whole yard full of people with them guns and masks and all kinds of stuff, so I did put them in here. But that is not where Ricky lived. Huddled together in a cramped space, measuring just about 1.5 by 3.5 meters, the room itself was not only shockingly small, but also ingeniously hidden. Acting on a tip, investigators equipped with a search warrant peeled back the layers of secrecy to uncover a concealed compartment within the walls of Ricky's grandmother's home, a hidden panel, a small crawl space, and then a shocking revelation, a room that had kept a mother and her son isolated from the outside world. The details that emerged painted a disturbing picture of captivity and depth. Deprivation. Ricky, a child who should have been exploring the world and experiencing the joys of childhood, had spent his days confined to a space that can only be likened to a prison cell. The lack of access to fresh air and daylight had left a mark on the young boy, evident when he was released from his confines. We let him out of the patrol car, and he ran around like he'd never seen outdoors. It was actually very sad, shared Illinois State Police Master Sergeant Stan Diggs. But amidst the darkness, a glimmer of resilience shone through. Ricky's spirit remained unbroken. Despite the isolation and confinement, he exhibited a surprising social nature and a polite demeanor, traits that stood in stark contrast to his dire circumstances. The story of Ricky Chekevdia's hidden imprisonment serves as a chilling reminder of the depths a deranged parent is willing to plunge to exert control over a child's life. The narrative compels us to confront the horrifying reality that such stories are not isolated incidents, as similar cases lurk beneath the surface, waiting to be uncovered. As we delve into the disturbing details and grapple with the implications, one thing becomes undeniably clear, the human capacity for cruelty knows no bounds. In one of the most horrifying incidents of the 2000s in Austria, we look at Elizabeth Fritzel, who was kept captive by her father for more than two decades without anyone knowing. However, unlike Ricky's mother, who kept her son with herself out of some form of love and affection, the case of Fritzel is completely unacceptable for any society. Fritzel had been held captive by her father, Josef Fritzel, and raped, assaulted, and sexually assaulted for more than two decades, which even resulted in the birth of seven children. You heard it right. A father raped his daughter for 24 years, resulting in seven and incest children who led a life of captivity as well. Out of the seven children, three were held in captive along with their mother, Elizabeth. One of them died shortly after birth and cremated by Fritz, while the other three were raised together by Joseph and his wife, Rosemary. According to the police reports, Joseph's dad had abandoned him when he was four years old and went on to die in Wapitwit II. In 1956, he married Rosemary and had seven children, one of whom was Elizabeth. According to her testimony, Fritzel began sexually assaulting Elizabeth when she was only 11 years old. Even though Though Fritzel had several commercial properties earning him decent money, his record had never been clean. In fact, he was acquitted for raping a 24-year-old nurse on the threat of killing her and was a suspect in another rape case, this time a 21-year-old woman. He did serve 12 months in an Austrian prison, however, the authorities deleted his records after 15 years, hence allowing him to adopt three children of Elizabeth, as the local social service authorities were not aware of his history. On November 12, 1986, Martina Claudia Posch, a 17-year-old girl from Vocklerbruck, Austria, vanished without a trace. Her absence from an agreed meeting with her boyfriend raised alarm bells, leading authorities on a search that would reveal a disturbing series of events. On November 22, 1986, scuba divers stumbled upon Martina's lifeless body, concealed within two olive green tarpaulins on the shore of Lake Monzi. The autopsy unveiled the grim truth. She had been strangled to death just hours after leaving her home. The dark cloud of suspicion loomed over Josef Fritzl, given his connection to the location and the striking physical resemblance 
resemblance Martina bore to his own daughter Elizabeth. Martina's tragic fate was not the only haunting chapter in Fritzl's sinister narrative. He was also a suspect in the death of Anna Neumeyer, 17, who had been killed with a captive bolt pistol in 1966. A disappearance, while Fritzl worked nearby, led to suspicions, as did the murder of Gabriele Supakova, a 20-year-old prostitute, in 2007. Supakova's body was found near the Austrian-Czech border during Fritzl's vacation. Despite these eerie coincidences, Fritzl was not charged due to insufficient evidence. After his apprehension, Fritzl's self-portrayal further unveiled the depths of his depraved psyche. He astonishingly claimed that his actions towards his daughter were consensual, not criminal. Fritzl, who imprisoned his own daughter in a cellar for 24 years, sought to justify his behavior by depicting it as a normal occurrence. He painted a picture of a twisted double life, where he engaged in normal activities with his captive family while condemning his own deeds in secret. Fritzl's disturbed childhood painted a grim backdrop to his monstrous actions. He described his mother as initially strict, but later became abusive and controlling. His eventual treatment of his mother was equally horrifying. Fritzl locked her in the attic, cut off from the world until her death in 1980. Forensic psychiatrists delved into Fritzl's psyche, diagnosing him with severe personality disorders, including borderline, schizotypal, and schizoid traits. Fritzl admitted to planning his daughter's captivity as an outlet for his evil side, indicating a deeply ingrained pathology. His claims of being born to rape offer a chilling insight into the darkness that consumed him. This is not an isolated incident of evil doing by a parent to their children. In fact, another case of incest came forward from Sheffield Town, where a 54-year-old man had held his daughters captive undetected for over 25 years and raped them repeatedly. To protect the names of his daughters and the seven surviving children coming out of this abuse, the court has not revealed their names to the public. The man had managed to keep the entire ordeal under covers for this long by keeping his daughters out of school any time they showed any signs of abuse. Their mother had also left the family due to repeated abuse from the father. The abuse started when they were 8 and 10 respectively, and it went on for several years with him abusing them on a daily basis. In some instances, he used to put these girls against the gas stove so that if they tried to resist, they'd get burnt. They were even threatened that if anyone gets the news about this, he will kill them and their children. The heinous acts don't end here. He even used to rape them when they were pregnant, and when there were children, he used to rape one of them while the other was babysitting. In total, there were 19 pregnancies between the both of them, and he even discouraged the use of contraceptives, beating them if they tried otherwise. The event caused quite an uproar in the Sheffield area, with responses from the PM as well. Due to the father moving them from place to place so often, the daughters never got the chance to get close to anyone, and thus, the crimes went unreported for over two decades. The crimes went to such a limit that the daughters started paying their dad to stop raping them and gave him whiskey in the hopes that excess drinking would result in his death. The situation with child protection services in this case showed a big problem in the UK system. At the same time, there were other cases that also showed that the system might not be working well. People in the country were shocked to realize that chances to stop the abuse had been missed many times. It was really upsetting to know that the victims had suffered for so long without anyone helping them. The dad's terrible actions were driven by wanting more money and control. He was taking welfare benefits meant for his own daughters, which made things even worse. The mistakes made by the authorities were very clear when we see that there were around 150 times when they could have stepped in and stopped the terrible things from happening. The victims tried really hard to escape from their dad's abuse, but they were very powerless. They reached out to Childline for help, but the organization couldn't promise to keep their kids safe. Bad divorce. Ricky's mum faced a difficult situation because of problems in her marriage with Ricky's dad. They were going through a divorce, which means they were separating and not living together anymore. But divorces can be really tough, especially when there are disagreements about important things like where the children should live and who should take care of them. In Ricky's case, his parents were having a hard time agreeing on these things, and this led to a big problem. Ricky's mum felt like she wasn't being heard or treated fairly in the divorce process. She was worried that Ricky's dad might get full custody of Ricky, which means Ricky might have to live with his dad most of the time. This made her really upset and scared because she wanted to be close to Ricky and take care of him too. In the realm of heart-wrenching family dramas, the case of Julian Hernandez and his father, Bobby Hernandez, emerges as a stark illustration of the depths a parent can sink to manipulate their child's life. This poignant narrative also draws unsettling parallels to the haunting story of Ricky Chikhevdia, showcasing how parental actions can lead to unthinkable consequences. Julian's tale unfolds as a convoluted web of deceit, beginning with his abduction at the age of five by his own father. 
Driven by a bitter custody battle, Bobby Hernandez orchestrated an elaborate charade that spanned nearly 14 years. Under a new identity, Julian was made to believe his mother had abandoned him, entangling him further in a fabricated reality. This chilling resemblance to Ricky Chekevdia's ordeal is uncanny, as both cases are marked by the manipulation of parental figures. Fueled by conflict and desperation, Shannon Wilfong concealed her son Ricky in a hidden compartment, while Bobby Hernandez crafted a false identity for Julian, reshaping his reality and identity through calculated deceit. Julian's journey took an unexpected turn when discrepancies in his social security information were unearthed during his college application process. This revelation, reminiscent of Ricky's eventual discovery in a secret crawl space, exposed the truth behind Julian's false existence. It also mirrored the disturbing lengths parents like as Julian faced his father in court, expressing forgiveness and the desire for connection. The poignant parallels to Ricky's story come into stark relief. Both cases underscored the resilience of these children, who emerged from their ordeals with hope and determination despite their dire circumstances. The narratives of Julian Hernandez and Ricky Chekevdia serve as cautionary tales, revealing the complexities of custody battles and parental manipulation. They implore us to remain vigilant and recognize the warning signs of such manipulation, ensuring that children's safety and well-being are never compromised in the name of familial conflicts. These stories remind us that even amidst the darkness, the human spirit has the capacity to endure, to heal, and to find hope. In another example of parents going to extreme lengths to keep their children, we look at the case of Aranza Maria Ochoa Lopez, who disappeared in 2018 and was found in Mexico after a five-year gap. Aranza disappeared when she was only four years old and went to the mall with her mother in Vancouver. She was last seen being taken out of the mall by her mother, which sparked great distress in her family, and authorities were hot on her tail to ensure that the small girl was safe. The turning point came when Aranza's mother, Esmeralda Lopez Lopez, was arrested in Puebla, Mexico, nearly a year later. The arrest marked a glimmer of hope in the case, but Aranza's whereabouts remained shrouded in mystery, intensifying the efforts of the FBI and their counterparts in Mexico. Collaboration between law enforcement agencies on both sides of the border proved instrumental. Mexican authorities, in a breakthrough discovery, located Aranza in Michoacan, Mexico, in February. The joyous news reverberated across nations, culminating in her safe return to the United States under the escort of FBI special agents. Richard A. Collodi, special agent in charge of the FBI's Seattle field office, emphasized the unwavering commitment to Aranza's recovery. For more than four years, Years. The FBI and our partners did not give up on Aranza, he stated, underlining the determination that fueled the investigation. The story of Aranza's resurgence sheds light on the intricate challenges faced in cases of missing children, particularly when familial abductions are involved. Her mother's actions, taking her during a supervised visit and absconding to Mexico, underscore the complexities and urgency of these cases. However, Aranza's story is not isolated. It mirrors a broader pattern in child abductions. Statistics from the National Center for Missing and Exploited children highlight that the majority of missing children cases involve abductions by family members, a sobering reality that demands continued vigilance. Aranza's journey began in 2018 when she vanished from a mall in Vancouver, Washington during a supervised visit with her mother. Similarly, Ricky Chekevdia and his mother, Shannon Wilfong, disappeared from the public eye in 2007 amidst a heated custody battle. Both cases stemmed from parental conflict, leaving children caught in the crossfire. In both instances, parental actions led to agonizing separations. Ricky's mother resorted to hiding him in a concealed room for two years, while Aranza's mother abducted her during a supervised visit and fled to Mexico. Both children found themselves thrust into a bewildering world of uncertainty, deprived of the stability and normalcy they deserved. One of the major cases that come to mind when talking about bad divorce is the infamous Sean Goldman abduction case. The Sean Goldman case serves as a poignant illustration of the tumultuous aftermath of a contentious divorce, where the consequences of child abduction reverberate across international borders. In 2004, Sean Goldman, a young boy born to an American father and Brazilian mother, embarked on a seemingly innocent trip to Brazil with his mother, Bruna Bianchi. However, what was meant to be a short vacation escalated into a prolonged separation when Bruna decided not to return Sean to his father in the United States. This abduction initiated a protracted legal battle between Sean's father, David Goldman, and Bruna Bianchi. The complexity of the case hinged on the Hague Convention on the civil aspects of international child abduction, a legal framework aimed at safe safeguarding children from parental abduction across international boundaries. Despite a Brazilian court acknowledging the wrongful nature of Sean's removal from the US in 2005, the court's ruling did not result in Sean's immediate return, leaving his father in anguish. As the legal proceedings unfolded, Sean's mother remarried and subsequently passed away while giving birth. This tragic turn of events further entangled the custody dispute. The international media spotlight focused on Sean's plight, catching the attention of Congressman Chris Smith of New Jersey. His involvement 
catalyzed diplomatic efforts and political discussions involving U.S. officials and Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva. After years of legal wrangling and diplomatic negotiations, a Brazilian federal court finally ordered Sean's return to his father in December 2009. However, a delay ensued as a Brazilian Supreme Court judge mandated that Sean should have the opportunity to express his preferences in court. Ultimately, Sean was reunited with his father on December 24, 2009, marking the end of a five-and-a-half-year separation. These stories show us the dark side of bad divorces that leave a lasting impact on the children and parents. The case of Ricky is just one of the thousands of other bad divorce settlements that break up families and can even lead to mental harassment of the parents, leading them to take such extreme steps. Judgment the case of Ricky Chikevdia, who was hidden by his mother and grandmother for nearly two years, is a disturbing tale that sheds light on the lengths some individuals are willing to go to in order to manipulate and control their own family members. The story began with the bitter custody battle between Ricky's parents, Shannon Wilfong and Michael Chikevdia. The custody dispute escalated, with Ricky's mother resorting to extreme measures to keep him away from his father. She hid Ricky in a secret room behind a wall in her home where he endured unimaginable isolation and deprivation. The room, measuring only five feet wide by 12 feet long was a grim prison for the young boy. This shocking case finally came to light when authorities raided the home in September of 2009. Ricky was discovered in the hidden room and his mother and grandmother were arrested. The discovery exposed the disturbing reality of Ricky's life, where he was denied access to friends, medical attention, and education. He was held in captivity for nearly two years, hidden from the world behind a facade of normalcy. The legal process that followed revealed the extent of the abuse and manipulation. Shannon Wilfong pled guilty to five misdemeanors, resulting in fines and a short jail sentence. Shockingly, her punishment hardly serves as a deterrent for such heinous actions, leaving many concerned about the effectiveness of the justice system in preventing custodial interference. While Ricky's father, Michael Chikevdia, ultimately gained custody of his son, the case raises questions about the effectiveness of child protection services and the need for improved communication between institutions. Ricky's story is a stark reminder that the safety and well-being of children must always be a top priority, and that comprehensive Comprehensive reform is necessary to prevent similar tragedies in the future. After Ricky was found and taken away from his mother's hiding place, his life took another turn. He was placed with family members in southern Illinois, while officials from the Child Welfare Department tried to figure out what was best for him. This meant that Ricky and his father, Michael Chekevdia, were still apart and couldn't be together just yet. Michael Chekevdia, Ricky's father, had mixed feelings about the whole situation. He admitted that he had been doubtful that anything would change, and he didn't expect to be reunited with his son so soon. Soon. When he received the news that Ricky had been located, he was completely surprised and shocked. It was like a sudden and unexpected turn of events for him. On the other hand, Ricky's grandmother, Diane Dobbs, had a different perspective. She believed that this entire situation was planned to keep Ricky away from his father. She thought that the authorities hadn't done a proper job of looking into her daughter's claims and that there were things that were overlooked. Dobbs was convinced that there was more to the story, and she challenged Chekevdia, Ricky's father, to take a polygraph test, which is a lie detector test, to prove his side of the story. Story. However, the world has seen some much worse cases of parental abuse on children, and these examples show us the damage that parents can do on their children if they are suffering from mental issues. Elizabeth Fritzel's harrowing ordeal under the control of her father, Josef Fritzel, is a chilling example of long-term captivity and abuse. The legal proceedings surrounding the case shed light on the complex legal challenges and the extensive trauma endured by Elizabeth and her children. After years of being held captive, Elizabeth Fritzel gave a crucial videotaped testimony before Austrian prosecutors in July 2008 in exchange for an agreement that she would never have to see her father again. In November 2008, Josef Fritzl was indicted on charges of murder, rape, incest, kidnapping, false imprisonment, and slavery. He stood trial facing the possibility of a maximum 20-year sentence for some charges and life imprisonment for others. The variety of charges reflected the horrific nature of his actions and the severity of the crimes committed. Elizabeth's captivity began in 1984 when Josef Fritzl lured her into the basement of their home under the pretense of needing help with a door. In reality, he had been constructing a hidden chamber to imprison her. Once she was inside, he rendered her unconscious with an ether-soaked cloth and locked her in. For the next 24 years, Fritzl visited the chamber regularly, supplying food and committing repeated acts of sexual violence against her. Elizabeth gave birth to seven children during her captivity, and one child tragically died shortly after birth. The case took a particularly disturbing turn when Fritzl allowed three of the captive children, Lisa, Monica, and 
and Alexander to be raised by him and his wife, posing as their foster parents. This added layer of manipulation and deception further highlighted the depths of Fritzel's cruelty. Elizabeth's captivity included grueling physical and emotional suffering. She and her children were forced to dig out the chamber and were subjected to threats and punishments. Fritzel's control was maintained through manipulation and fear, with empty threats of gas poisoning or electrocution if they attempted to escape. The case also exposed how Fritzel managed to maintain his facade for so long. He deceived social workers during their visit and even fooled tenants and neighbors with explanations for the strange noises coming from the basement. This prolonged deception added to the shock and disbelief surrounding the case. In comparison to other cases discussed earlier, the Fritzl case is a haunting example of the extent to which an individual can exert power and control over their own family members. The legal proceedings and ultimate indictment of Josef Fritzl underscore the importance of justice in cases of prolonged captivity and abuse. The severity of the charges reflected the gravity of the crimes, serving as a reminder of the need for comprehensive legal measures to address such atrocities. The trial of Josef Fritzl, charged with a series of heinous crimes, including kidnapping, rape, and imprisonment of his own daughter, Elizabeth Fritzl, and their children, began on March 16, 2009. The trial took place in the city of St. Polten, Austria, presided over by Judge Andrea Humer. Fritzl, who attempted to shield his face from cameras using a blue folder, entered the courtroom on the first day of the trial. During the trial, Fritzl admitted his guilt to all charges except for murder and grievous assault. He was accused of using the threat of gassing his captives to maintain control over them. His defense counsel, Rudolf Mayer, appealed to the jury to approach the case objectively and not be swayed by emotions. Mayer portrayed Fritzl as not a monster and emphasized moments like Fritzl bringing a Christmas tree down to the cellar to humanize him in the eyes of the jurors. The prosecution, led by Chief Prosecutor Christian Berkheiser, pressed for life imprisonment in a facility for the criminally insane. Berkheiser presented evidence of the dungeon's conditions, including its low ceiling and dampness. Jurors were given a first-hand experience of the environment with objects from the cellar that emanated a musty odor. The trial took a traumatic turn when the jury watched 11 hours of recorded testimony from Elizabeth Fritzl. This recording, which detailed her horrific experiences, was so emotionally taxing that jurors could only watch small portions at a time. Elizabeth's brother also testified, speaking about his own abuse at the hands of Josef Fritzl during their childhood. Elizabeth Fritzl herself attended the trial on the second day as she was preparing to write a book about her ordeal. Her presence caused a significant impact on Josef Fritzl, who visibly broke down upon recognizing her in the courtroom. Following this encounter, Fritzl changed his plea to guilty on all charges. On March 19, 2009, Josef Fritzl was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 15 years without the possibility of parole. He accepted the sentence without planning to appeal. Fritzl is currently serving his sentence at Garston Abbey, a former monastery converted into a prison in Upper Austria. The shocking case received international attention, prompting Austria's Chancellor, Alfred Gusenbauer, to launch a foreign public image campaign for the country to address the abhorrent events that had taken place. The Fritzl trial stands as a stark example of justice being served in the face of unimaginable cruelty and abuse. The case of Aranza Maria Ochoa Lopez, who was kidnapped by her biological mother, Esmeralda Lopez Lopez, shares several similarities with the cases we've discussed earlier. These similarities emphasize the potential severity of Ricky's case and the impact it could have had on his family, particularly his mother. Aranza was abducted from a shopping center in Vancouver, Washington, when she was just four years old on October 25th, 2018. Her biological father's identity has been kept away from the media, reflecting an attempt to shield personal information from the public eye, similar to how Ricky Chikevdia's case attempted to maintain certain aspects of privacy. Esmeralda Lopez Lopez, Aranza's biological mother, was eventually arrested in Puebla, Mexico, after more than a year. In the case of Aranza, Lopez Lopez pleaded guilty to the charges after nearly two years and was sentenced to 20 months in prison, similar to how Shannon Wilfong, Ricky's mother, pleaded guilty and received a relatively milder sentence of probation and fines. However, unlike Ricky's case, where he was found after two years, it took more than a year after Lopez Lopez's guilty plea to locate Aranza's whereabouts in Michoacan, Mexico. This highlights the challenges and complexities involved in investigating such cases and recovering abducted children. The involvement of multiple law enforcement agencies, including the FBI's cooperation with Mexican authorities, reflects the international effort to locate and rescue abducted children. This collaborative approach was similarly seen in Ricky's case, where various organizations and authorities were engaged in the investigation. While the legal outcomes in these cases vary, the similarities underscore the potential long-term traumatic effects on the abducted children and their families. Similarly, the case of the British Fritzl involved prolonged incestuous abuse and led to investigations and charges. While the accused received jail time, the penalties were criticized as insufficient considering the extent of the abuse. 
Furthermore, let's discuss the case of Martina Claudia Posh, whose murder shed light on the significance of thorough investigations and legal processes. When her body was discovered, it prompted a deeper look into potential suspects and their involvement in other cases, such as the infamous Fritzl case in Austria. This interconnectedness among cases underscores the importance of having well-rounded legal actions that consider the broader consequences of such crimes. It's important to note that the outcomes of legal proceedings in cases of custodial interference and abduction can vary widely. Some cases result in relatively light punishments that may not match the seriousness of the crime, while others lead to more appropriate penalties that align with the severity of the offense. By comparing these cases, we can understand the need for comprehensive legal procedures that prioritize the well-being of the victims and the pursuit of justice. In wrapping up our exploration of these compelling real-life cases, we've seen how custody battles can lead to complex and impactful situations. From Ricky Chekevdia to Sean Goldman, Aranza Lopez, Lopez and Martina Posh. These stories shed light on the emotional struggles and legal challenges that can arise. If you're eager for more captivating narratives and diverse topics, the video on your screen is your next stop. Click to continue your journey into a world of intriguing information. Stay curious and keep exploring.